Suffering with suffixes. So, given a word W, we say that U is a proper suffix of W if there is a V not equal to the empty string, such that W is equal to VU. So before we go on with the problem, let's just make sure we have the definition of proper suffix down. So if W is equal to the string M-A-T-H, take a moment and make sure you know what the proper suffixes of W would be. Okay, they would be A-T-H, T-H, H, and the empty string. So importantly, the proper suffixes don't include the original string, and they do include the empty string. Cool. So now for a language L, we define the suff of L, which is going to be another language that consists of all the words in L, such that these words don't have a proper suffix of them in L. So once again, let's make sure we do a couple examples and have the definition of suff L down. So let's say L is equal to the language dog cat. What would suff L be? It would also be dog cat. This is because the string dog doesn't have any proper suffixes of it in L, and neither does the string cat, so both of them can be in suff L. Now what about if L was equal to at cat? Then suff L would just be the string at, because at doesn't have any proper suffixes of it in L, but cat has the proper suffix at, so at effectively eliminates cat from being in suff L. What about if L was empty string giraffe math? Well, then suff L would just be the empty string because the empty string is a proper suffix of all of these words and kind of eliminates all of them. And how about if L was equal to CA cat? Well, then suff L would also be equal to CA cat. So this is because a proper suffix, importantly, starts at the end of the word. So any substring or prefix doesn't work. It has to be a suffix in order to eliminate a string from being in suff L. Awesome. With those definitions out of the way, let's get to our claim. So our claim is that if the original language L is regular, then suff of L should also be regular. In other words, if we assume L is regular, in other words, we assume that we've got a DFA M sub L defined by a five tuple that decides it, then we should be able to create a DFA M sub S defined by its own five tuple to decide suff of L. Okay, so the task at hand is coming up with this DFA M sub S, and we need to specify what the elements of this five tuple are. So conveniently, the alphabet we can already kind of see is going to be the same alphabet, so we don't have to worry about that. But we've got to figure out what the four things in this five tuple should be. It often helps to do a couple of examples and get a feel for when MS should accept and when MS should reject. So if you've got a string and you know it's in L, and you check all of its proper suffixes, and they're all not in L, then we know that our machine ms should accept. And there's a couple of ways that our machine ms should reject. If you've got a string and it's not in L, it doesn't even matter what its proper suffixes are, we know that ms should reject. If you've got a string and it is in L, but at least one of its proper suffixes is also in L, then we also know that ms should reject. Importantly, being in L or not being in L is decided by M sub L. So this makes it really clear that there's a nice relationship between when ML accepts and rejects and when we want our new machine MS to accept and reject. This kind of hints at the fact that when defining the five tuple for MS, we're going to be reusing a lot of the components from ML. You might be a little nervous for creating this five tuple and wondering how we're going to track all this information from all these different proper suffixes because a DFA can only store a finite amount of information and it really shouldn't be dependent on the length of the string. But hopefully this kind of arrangement looks a little similar to something you saw in lecture, threading. So whenever you're doing a threading problem, it can be super helpful to give yourself some examples to look at. So let's go back to one of those examples from the start and let's look at the string cat. Well, cat is in suff of L, so we know that M sub S should accept. And since M sub S is dependent on M sub L, let's look at a run of M sub L on the string cat. Well, we know we start off at Q naught, then we read the character C and we end up at some other state. And we're basically just making up these state names as we go. This is just for visualization purposes. So we read C, we end up at some state. We read A, we end up at another state. We read T, we end up at this final state. 
And we actually know that this final state has to be an accepting state because cat is also in L. Additionally, we also want to run m sub L on all of the proper suffixes of cat. So this would be one thread, but we also want to run m sub L on just at. So we would have to start a new thread here so we can read at. We want another thread for reading just t. So we start a new thread here and just read t. And we want another thread for reading just the empty string. So for completion, just so we can see what this looks like when all the threads are running in parallel, let's do a rejecting example as well. So in this case, the string cat is not in suff of L. So m sub s should reject. So in our first thread, again, we start off at q naught, and this thread is essentially the same as before. But as we read c, we have to open up the new thread. Then we progress both of these threads forward, and we open up a new thread. Then we progress all three of these threads forward, and we open up a new thread. And importantly, because one of the proper suffix threads was in an accepting state at the end, that's why m sub s should reject. So let's take this example and keep it to the side for reference so we can get back to our proof. Hopefully with the intuition we've gained from doing these examples, we can now formally specify our five tuple for the DFA m sub s. So this means we've got to specify a new set of states, a new transition function, a new start state, and a new set of accepting states. Let's start off with q sub s, the set of new states. Going back to our example, each state is just whatever information you're tracking at a particular point in time. So our start state is this. Then we transition to the next state, transition to the next state, transition to the next state. At each point in time, we can see that each new state consists of one old state and then a set of old states. So in notation, that means q sub s is going to be the set of old states cross the set of sets of the old states. In other words, q cross the power set of q. Next is our new transition function, delta sub s. This is often the trickiest part, and it can really help to first write down what the domain and codomain are. So delta sub s is a function that takes in a new state, takes in a character, and outputs a new state. It can even help to write it out substituting what we know each new state looks like. So this might seem kind of unwieldy, but this actually helps when we're writing out the function. We know delta sub s is going to take in one old state, one set of old states, and one character. So q is our old state, s is our set of old states, and x is our new character that we're reading and we have to output one old state and a set of old states. So we know it's a tuple and we have to fill in these parts. So let's go back to our example to help and let's look at one transition. If we start off at this state and then we transition to this state, what exactly is going on here? Well, at the top, we're taking whatever this old state was and we're using the old transition function to transition it. Then we look at everything in this set and we transition all of these guys as well. Then we also open up a new thread. So step by step in our transition function, this is the first part in the tuple. So at this point, we just have to use the old transition function from m sub l, take the old state and transition it based on whatever character you just read. Then for the set of states, this consists of the union of two parts. First is transitioning everything that was already in the state, and the second is opening up a new thread. So transitioning everything that was already in the state looks like this. So we transition each little s inside of our big set s using the character we just read. And unioning each time we have to open a new thread, we always just add q naught. And that's our transition function. Our new start state, well, we can pretty much just read this off our example, is going to be a tuple consisting of the original old start state and then just an empty set. And that's it for the start state. So we move on to our set of new accepting states. So this is going to be a set of new states, each of which consists of the tuple of an old state and a set of old states under certain conditions. The conditions being that the first state has to be accepting and nothing in the set of old states can be accepting. So in notation, this means that q is an element of the old f, and s can't have any intersection with the old f. In other words, the intersection between them is the empty set. 
So with that done, that is our entire five tuple. So this, along with the verbal description of what's going on here and what the logic is, would be your completed proof.